Good evening, everyone. My name is John Pearson, and I'm a Kevin Harrington Student Ambassador. And on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at St. Anselm College and the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, I'd like, like to welcome you all to tonight's event. The Institute's mission is to engage, educate, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the political and civic um, communities and strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Before we begin tonight's ceremony, I'd like to ask everyone to please turn off any and all devices that make noise and also remind you that uh, we have microphones set up in the back of the auditorium on both sides. And during the Q&A uh, session, it'd be great if you could uh, speak into those microphones. Thank you. Tonight's speaker is, Do is Mr. John Hoffmeister. Mr. Hoffmeister served as president of Houston-based Shell Oil Company from 2005 to 2008. As Shell president, Mr. Hoffmeister launched an extensive outreach program to discuss critical global energy challenges. Following his career at Shell, Mr. Hoffmeister founded the nationwide membership associ association Citizens for Affordable Energy. This Washington, D.C. registered public policy education firm promotes US, en U.S. energy security solutions, including a range of affordable ener energy supplies, efficiency improvements, essential infrastructure, sustainable environmental policies, and public education about energy policy. Mr. Hoffmeister additionally serves as the chairman of the National Urban League, and he is a member of the U.S. Department of Energy's Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technical Advisory Committee and the Sodexo Business Advisory Board. Mr. Ho Mr. Hoffmeister earned bachelor's and master's degrees in political science from Kansas State University, and he is the author of Why We Hate the Oil Companies, Straight Talk from an Energy Insider. Mr. Hoffmeister will be discussing U.S. energy policy, alternative energy, and I'm sure it will be a very engaging and interesting discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Hoffmeister. <laughs> Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out on a cold winter evening. I would like to start by thanking St. Anselm's. I live in Houston, Texas, and I get to watch raw politics in action, thanks in part to St. Anselm's and the role that the Institute plays in bringing the voice of candidates to the American people. I find it fascinating. I've followed it for many, many election cycles. And for any of you who are involved in this, thank you for the public service that you perform. I'm not sure how many of you have noticed, but in the last seven weeks across the country, gasoline prices have spiked about 70 cents a gallon. I teach a class at Arizona State University in the first week of January, my class is on energy policy and the environmental policy of the nation. I always ask my students to take note of the gasoline price at the start of the class and then watch it over the 15-week course of the semester. So in Phoenix, Arizona, gasoline was $2.96 on the first week of January. This past Thursday when I was out in Tempe, $3.74. And so I ask my students, because they're studying this, why is the gasoline price rising? What's behind it? And I get a lot of very curious eyes waiting for me to give them the answer. And as I visit with people like yourselves all over the country, ladies and gentlemen, it's painful to remind ourselves that this is the fifth January in a row 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, the 5th January in a row that this nation has seen the crude oil price rise dramatically in the first quarter, the retail gasoline price rising right along with it, and then sometime around July, August, September, it starts to drift downward a bit. But as you can hear from the media reports, the rise this year is bigger and higher, faster than in the previous four years. What's going on? Is this the oil companies just deciding it's time to dig into our pocketbooks? Is it some natural 
event that somehow in winter we use more fuel than summer, when the opposite is actually true. We use less in winter than in summer. Is it the turnarounds in the refineries that shut down manufacturing production temporarily to do maintenance and get rid of obsolescent equipment and processes and refineries that happens this time every year? Or what is it? I'll give you the simplest explanation I can offer. It's none of the above. It's the fact that we as a nation have allowed ourselves over decades, not years, decades, from Richard Nixon to today, while declaring the intention to become more energy independent, we have remained at the mercy of a cartel pricing scheme that is designed not by oil companies, not by U.S. government, not by some natural convolution of fate, but by a group of sovereign nations who export oil for a living, who decide the production level to achieve the price level that they would like to see fill their treasuries every year so that they can pay their bills and enjoy the lifestyles that they choose in those countries that produce and export oil. We are at the mercy of a pricing cartel of OPEC producers and have been for decades. And it's no coincidence that we went from 82, 83, 84 dollar a barrel crude oil in the October, November time frame to the high 80s and now to the 90s when in December of 2012 one of the largest producers in the world, in fact, the largest producer in the world, Saudi Arabia, reduced oil production by 900,000 barrels a day and kept that lower production level in the month of January. Now, in the face of European recession, in the face of the U.S. economy actually having negative growth in the fourth quarter by 0.1 percent, in the face of doubt around China's true growth rate, in the face of Japan, world's third largest economy, flat down economy for the last 20 years, in the face of all this negative economic information, it's not that demand has risen, it's that supply has shrunk. And that is the primary reason that we are seeing in each and every of the last five years an adjustment by OPEC producers that has impact on the global oil price and we become the victims. But are we the victims of OPEC or are we the victims of ourselves when this plays out, spring after spring? Now when we look ahead, set OPEC aside, when we look ahead at the future global demand for oil and what's going to happen over the next 10 or 20 years, there will be people who will tell you it's time to go off oil. I wouldn't be happier, couldn't be happier to go off oil. Because as an oil executive, when I would look honestly into the eyes of a customer and realize that the gasoline that they are buying is going into an internal combustion engine vehicle that is going to operate at 20% efficiency, which means that 80 cents on the dollar that they are spending for gasoline is going to be wasted as heat and friction in the vehicle, and only 20 cents on the dollar is actually buying the go juice that gives them mobility, I have to wonder about my own integrity in selling you a product that you're only going to use at a rate of 20% efficiency. It's like selling you a light bulb where the efficiency is 3%. Or it's like selling you a solar system where the efficiency is only 8 or 9%. You're not getting a lot for your money when you're buying something that is terribly inefficient. But the internal combustion engine is the best we've had from a mobility standpoint. And we're at the point now in this country where 250 million vehicles are on the road today that only use gasoline or some combination with ethanol. And so there's no competition for 
transportation fuel. Battery vehicles are just, just barely breaking into the market. Not in material numbers, not that make a difference. And they're not going to in the coming years. Not at the price tag, and not with the uncertainty over battery life and how long you can drive a an electric vehicle. Hybrids make it a little bit better. But we're going to be stuck with oil and gas the path we're on for a long time to come. So are we going to still suffer high-priced OPEC pricing? But I said set OPEC aside. Let's look at the future of world oil supply in the next 10, 20, 30 years. The existing basins around the world give us about 88 million barrels a day. We're pushing it to get 88 million barrels a day. The U.S. uses about 18 of those 88 million barrels a day. We're the primary user of global oil. We produce in this country just under 7 million barrels a day out of the 18 million that we need. That means we need a lot of oil for both feedstocks, for our chemical industry, but also for transportation and aviation and trucking and marine and other applications like lubricants. And so we have to have imported oil to meet our daily requirements. But if we look at our consumption of 18 million barrels a day, let's look at China for a moment. In 2005, China consumed 5 million barrels a day. In 2010, I'm sorry, 2011, 10 million barrels a day. By 2015, China's going to need 15 million barrels a day. That's a huge increase in demand on a daily basis. And India will go from four to seven million barrels a day demand over the next five years. And the rest of the developing world, one or two million barrels a day. So if you just do the math, over the next five to six years, ladies and gentlemen, we have to go from 88 million barrels a day to 98 million barrels a day just to stay even with demand. And frankly, nobody knows how to do that. Our increase of five million to seven million in the last two and a half years has been a godsend. But it's still only seven in a country that needs 18. So as we look ahead, we are going to be competing on a continuing basis with the rest of the world for the oil that we need just to get through the day. And if you look at the, what's talked about as future development basins off Brazil, those of you who follow this industry, huge oil deposits in what's called the pre-salt off of the uh, east coast of Brazil. Or the Arctic, which has billions of barrels in the Arctic circle. Or East Africa, more billions of barrels not touched yet. Mozambique, Madagascar, not even touched. Off West Africa's coast, barely touched. So there's all kinds of oil out there to be had. But let's be clear, it's not in the next 10 years. In Brazil, it's so deep and so close to the magma of the earth that what's holding back major production is that the metallurgy of the industry is not equal to the heat and pressure of the earth. The metal gets soft. You can't drill with a soft drill bit. And so metallurgists are working with nanotechnology to harden metals beyond what we've ever, ever known as hard metals. Off the east coast of Africa, Mozambique, Madagascar, Tanzania, Kenya, huge, huge new discoveries. But there's no infrastructure. Not only is there no physical infrastructure, which you need to obviously drill and transport oil, there's no legal infrastructure. There are no institutions of government that can create the legal infrastructure that's credible in terms of contract and adjudic contract law and adjudication. It's never been necessary. It's never existed. It has to be invented. And it needs to be invented in a way so that corruption and shifting of dollars paid into the countries to private bank accounts in Switzerland doesn't harm either the countries or the industry that's trying to develop that. Arctic Circle, my former company, has been trying over the last seven years, almost eight years, to get into the Arctic Circle off the coast of Alaska. I was part of starting that process back in the 2005 to 2008 period. 
It's now 2013. They have yet to produce a gallon of crude oil. But that's according to plan. There was never a plan to rush because the Arctic is different. You have got to have the technology and the environmental protections and the skill and ability to pursue drilling or development of the Arctic Circle very different in the Gulf of Mexico. And it would be a learning journey. But material oil from the Arctic could well be in the 2030s, not the 20-teens. And so when you think of that 98 million barrel of demand, and you think about what we do every day to struggle to get to 88 million, and you think of the U.S. at 7 million, these numbers aren't going in the direction of the consumer. These numbers are going in the direction of paying at the pump. Let's shift gears now. Let's talk about the electricity system of the country. The good news is we have the world's largest, most technologically sophisticated, most efficient and effective and ubiquitous and homogeneous electricity power generation distribution system right to the consumer's home, wherever that home may be, of any nation in the world. That is fantastic. We have electrified our lives to our benefits. And in a post-industrial age, even as our energy appliances have gotten ever more efficient, we're still demanding more energy because of the applications we're discovering for greater use of energy, such as all the devices that we now carry around with us, which need to be recharged. And eventually, more automobiles will need to be recharged with electricity. And so our demand for electricity is hardly shrinking. And don't forget, our 310 million people, us and our neighbors in this country, by 2040, there will be another 90 million of us, if you follow the demographer's logic. So we need energy for 400 million people by 2040. And 2040 is not that far away. Just add 28 years to your age today, and it's 2040 already. 400 million people. But there's one other descriptor of our energy system that we should realize is also true. We have the world's oldest electricity generation distribution system in the world. The world's oldest. And we see the effects of our old system, don't we, with weather events when we can't handle storms, winds, heavy snows, hurricanes, because the system's all above ground. Go to European cities, you aren't going to see telephone poles. Or if you do, you'll see concrete telephone poles that don't bend in the wind. Yes, they're more expensive, but they're also more modern. Go to Chinese newer cities. It's underground. But we live with an old system that is vulnerable in the manner in which it operates. And when we look at our power generation sources, we have 600 coal plants. Average age is over 40 years old. Design life, 50. We have 104 nuclear reactors in this country. Average age, over 30. Design life, 40. Or should say permitted life, 40 years old. Here in your neighborhood, you've got some disputes going on with a nuclear power plant next door and whether it should be permitted for an extension or not. About 60 of those 104 nuclear reactors have been granted an additional 20 years of permitted life. So instead of living near a 40-year-old nuclear plant, you get to live near a 60-year-old nuclear power plant. The point of aging is the reality that aging leads to higher risk. Risk of breakdown, risk of added cost for more maintenance, and risk of safety and, and, and other issues. And so we need to decommission a lot of the existing generation capacity, but what do we replace it with? Do we replace it with more nuclear at all the costs of a current new nuclear facility? 
Do we replace it with more coal, which is, which is a 20, actually a 19th century energy source, which we nursed through the 20th century, but now the public is basically saying, please, can't we move beyond coal? And we're unwilling, it seems, to try to clean coal up and to put the technology that some countries are using called coal gasification with carbon capture and sequestration into effect to use coal without the resulting emission problem that exists from coal. And we tend to ignore that as an opportunity and instead decommission coal plants. We are building new gas plants because we have an abundance of natural gas, priced very low because there's so much abundance but a natural gas plant is no good to anyone if it doesn't have a natural gas supply. Where do you get natural gas in New England? Not next door. It has to be piped in. And the pipes that exist today are chock-a-block full of natural gas at the pressures that the pipelines can tolerate. And so the only way to get more natural gas into New England or other parts of the country where they have been dependent on coal for so long or aging nuclear plants for so long is to build the pipeline infrastructure that can bring new gas, new gas supplies to build new power plants powered by natural gas. And trying to build a pipeline is just about as easy as trying to build an overhead transmission line in parts of the country where people don't want either pipelines or transmission lines because they just don't want them because it looks like industrializing nature, which it is, especially if it's overhead. Or if it's a pipeline underground, you dig up the forest in order to bury the pipeline, which leads a path through trees, which people don't want to have to see. And so there are all kinds of issues, ladies and gentlemen, from a transportation fuel standpoint and this Last 10 years of ever-rising gasoline prices with no end in sight and an aging electrical system which is continually more brittle and continually higher risk without any remedy in clear sight. And so what kind of political leadership are we getting about these two dilemmas? Aging electricity system and a insufficient supply of transportation fuels to keep the price affordable for everyday people. Well, the 112th Congress, which ended its business last December 31st, didn't pass a single page of energy legislation of any kind. And by the way, neither did the 111th Congress pass a single page of energy legislation of any kind, or environmental legislation that would give a signal to industry as to what to do, what's important. President Obama, from January 2012 through the campaign, talked about an all-in, all-the-above energy plan. Meanwhile, leases on federal lands dropped 50% during the first term of the Obama administration. And offshore drilling five-year plans, the only one that was put forward was two years late and was a rehash of old lease plans rather than opening up new territories offshore. Yes, we did increase domestic oil production and domestic natural gas production on state lands, on, I'm sorry, under state permits on private lands but not federal lands. Production is down on federal lands. So I'm not sure what all in all the above means, except that this is the fifth year in a row that we're watching prices climb. And the fifth year in a row, and I'm really talking since Obama became president, but let me go back to the Bush years. George W. Bush, everybody said, oh, the oil president, right? The oil president. George W. Bush said, in July 2008, he's got six months left. In July 2008, George W. Bush said, for the first time as President of the United States, we need more drilling. 
we need to open up more access. Now, if you have any political memory of 2008, President Bush's political standing and favorability by July 2008 was worse than Congress's and about equal to Richard Nixon's by the end of his term. So for the President to say what he said in July 2008, rhetoric, words, meant nothing. Too late to do anything about it anyway. And so while people had this notion that he's an oil president, I'm testifying, others are testifying, every time there's a rise in the oil price, we're called in to explain these high oil prices and these excessive profits by the oil companies, and we would plead, plead to Congress, please, more access. If we want to offset high prices, we need more production. We need more supply. Look, we're importing more oil than we're producing. If we produced more domestic, we could import less foreign oil. Over and over. I had six testimonies myself in an 18-month period. Same testimony. Multiple committees. No results from a public policy standpoint. So I would suggest to you that while we have this transportation fuel problem and we have this electricity grid aging problem, leadership at the political level is just completely unacceptable if we're talking about solving the problem. Wind, solar, and biofuels are fantastic. In my previous life, in corporate life, invested in all three. Learned a lot of lessons. They're fantastic because they're clean. But you know what? They're not material to the current energy system. And there's no plan for them to become material to the current energy system because the intermittency and the inefficiency are so great that the cost of implementation is beyond what consumers are willing to pay by and large. Oh, we'll still grow it. We'll still develop it. But it's being developed at such a slow pace relative to the demand requirements of the overall economy and the aging of the electrical system that we can talk and talk and talk, but it's not going to make a material difference in the next decade while everything else gets older and everything else gets more expensive. There's another issue. I hope I'm not depressing you. But there's another issue, and then we'll turn it positive. Because this is actually a very positive talk. The other issue is the economy. The economy is lagging. We're not as bad as Europe. We're not as bad as Japan. But remember, the business of America is business. And business isn't growing as measured by the unemployment rate. Business isn't growing based on the macro numbers that we heard in the fourth quarter. And in the last several years, the best business has grown is at 2.4% in the last four years. We didn't do much better in the previous four years. So please don't think I'm attacking a particular president. Both parties are responsible. Both sets of presidents, since the Clinton years of much larger growth percentages, or the Reagan years of much larger growth percentages, we are not enjoying the benefits of business being the business of America, where business is about growth, business is about profitability, business is about job creation. We're not experiencing that because we don't have an engine of growth. In the 1980s, the engine of growth really came from what had been a very high inflation and recessionary period of the Nixon-Carter years, well, Nixon-Ford Carter, where the 70s were as a tough decade. And so in the 80s, under Ronald Reagan, with some of the fiscal decisions of Paul Volcker at the Federal Reserve, we took off, the economy took off. And yeah, housing got into a little trouble, a big bubble of housing in the 80s. We remember that. We recovered from that in the 90s. In the Clinton years, we had the big engine of growth called high tech, the dot-com world. Well, that got into a little bit of a bubble problem. But look at high tech today. 
it recovered. But it's not big enough to be the engine of growth as it was in the 90s. Housing was an engine of growth under the Bush years, but the regulators lost control. And the financial institutions whipped that growth into false growth by lacking the integrity to appropriately report that the tools of financial development were false. AAA bonds that were really junk. And Lord knows we paid the price because of a breakdown in the financial controls of corporations and in a breakdown in the oversight by financial regulators and frankly, if the truth be said, breakdown in the governance of the federal government over what it was asking the economy to do in those years. But when we have an engine of growth, this economy does very well. And so what I'd like to talk about next is the upside. Energy as the engine of growth for this decade. Example. I mentioned we produce 7 million barrels a day. In the 1970s and 80s, we used to produce 10 million barrels a day. Let's go back to 10. 10 million barrels a day on a 7 million barrel base is what, what percentage of growth? It's over 40% growth in the production of domestic oil. You might say, but we need to get off oil. I agree, but not yet. We can't. We need 250 million cars fueled as and when the owner wants to buy fuel. And until that fleet is replaced with an alternative fleet, we're going to need oil. Because that's all these cars use, is oil. So it can be, we can be idealists, we can be aspirational, but we got to live our daily life. And those cars will be on the road for the next 20 years. And in the next 10 years, Another hundred million of light cars will be on the road that also need gasoline because we're not producing battery cars or hydrogen fuel cell cars to replace internal combustion engine cars. Not yet. We'll come back to that. But go from 7 to 10. That is a over 40% increase in domestic oil production. Nine million people work in oil and, produ oil and gas production today. If you're going to ask that population to produce 40% more, how many more people do you need to get to 10 million barrels a day and hold it there? Around 3 million. 3 million more people to make that possible. What we really need to do, though, to break OPEC's back, and I have no trouble saying an objective of the United States of America should be to break the cartel pricing scheme or regime of OPEC, which has cost us trillions of dollars that we have earned in this country, sent to their countries to buy the crude oil, and the most modern, most efficient, most exciting infrastructures in the world are in places like Dubai and Kuwait City and Tehran and Iran, while Buffalo crumbles, Detroit crumbles, and American cities going to pot because there's not enough money, because it's sitting somewhere else in the world courtesy of buying imported oil. And for those who hate oil, and I get that all the time, and I'm fine with the comments that we don't like oil, we're using it. It doesn't mean we have to love it, but until we have an alternative, and here's the alternative I promote now for the next 10, 20, 30 years, natural gas, as a competitor to gasoline. Natural gas, which we produce today at the rate of about 65 billion cubic feet a day, if we increase that number to roughly 100 billion cubic feet a day, we can get rid of 5 million barrels a day of imports. Wow! That takes us to the equivalent, if we do 10 million barrels a day, another 5 Equivalent of natural gas gets us to 15 in a country that uses 18. We're almost there. The 5 million barrels a day of oil import reduction is offset by 35 billion cubic feet of natural gas, 40% of which goes to make compressed natural gas for trucking, 
60% goes to make either methanol or gasoline from natural gas for our internal combustion engines. And if they're flex fuel engines, they can take 80 to 100% methanol as, as well as ethanol. So ethanol, methanol, compressed natural gas, we can also consider liquefied natural gas and gas to liquids, which is a diesel product, all from natural gas, all to replace imported oil. And it works just as well from a consumer's perspective. It's safe. We know how to produce it. We can produce it. We're not producing it because we are not drilling at the level to produce that much natural gas, which would take more expansion on federal lands. It would take more expansion on the offshore. And when President Obama says we can't drill our way out of this problem, he's just not correct. He says that because it's too hard to go up against his constituency, which is very much funded by people who want to move off oil. And I'm, as I said, I'm fine with moving off oil when we have the alternative opportunities to do so. But we haven't had the programs to really enable it. And we're going very slowly to move to alternative sources of transportation, not the least of which is our lack of investment in public transportation. And until we commit ourselves to some alternative form of transportation, we shouldn't starve ourselves or impoverish ourselves by refusing to develop our own natural resources. So when it comes to transportation fuel, 10 million barrels a day production instead of seven, 100 billion cubic feet of natural gas instead of 65, that's more millions of jobs. And it's not just the drillers that get jobs. Think of how much steel, how much pipe, how many valves, how many trucks, how many drilling rigs, how many uniforms, how much safety equipment, how much control equipment, how many inspectors, how many regulators, how many homes, how many educations that we will buy because of that spending. The economic multiplier is huge. I estimate the investment in capital alone to get to 100 million BCF and 10 million barrels a day is roughly a trillion dollars a year. And to sustain it over the 20, 30 years equals roughly 7% economic growth. What would this economy, what would this country be like at 7% economic growth? I'll tell you what, the federal deficit would go away. I'll tell you what, immigration would not be an issue. I'll tell you what, educators would have money to put into education. I'll tell you what, state treasuries would have money for infrastructure. And citizens would have money to live on. In part because the disposable income available to them from the lower energy prices for transportation fuel is but a part of it. It's the higher employment. It's the demand for people which affects wages. It is the educational competition for people that want better and better jobs in a growing job market. All the above comes together and it's called sustained economic growth where the engine of growth is our own domestic natural resource base which becomes utilized in a modern economy that is going to rely upon this energy for decades to come. And with respect to the energy power production system, whether it's natural gas, whether it's shifting from uranium-based nuclear power to thorium-based nuclear power, whether it is investing in clean coal technology, and the president talks about clean coal technology, we just don't do anything about it. We have more energy than we'll ever need, ladies and gentlemen. And as we do research and development on wind and solar and biofuels, it can only get better. The efficiency of solar has doubled in the last 10 years. Let's double it again and still move farther to make it more efficient. Let's develop the storage technology through R&D that makes the intermittency problem go away. And all of this together represents 
an additional hundreds of billions of dollars on top of the trillion. And we're looking at a sustainable economic growth path that takes us to one place, a place that Americans have learned to love, and that place is called prosperity. Prosperity. Who's talking about prosperity today? We're talking about this dumb and dumber solution to deficit spending called the sequester. <clears throat> Instead of talking about prosperity that eliminates the need for such a sequester. Because the government has more revenue without raising tax rates. Because more people are working. And more corporations are making more profit. Not just oil and gas companies, but the thousands of companies that supply them. And there are supply chain companies in oil and gas industry in all 50 states that benefit from this kind of expansion of domestic natural resource production. And what about the environment? There are three kinds of security that we have to worry about in life, in our social life. National security, defend our borders and enable citizen satisfaction to avoid civil unrest. Economic security, so we know how we're going to pay our bills and how we're going to live to ripe old ages and environmental security. Because we can't do to our children and grandchildren what was done to us. Maybe unknowingly, but our grandparents, my generation's grandparents and parents, created a real mess that we're living with today. The 20th century energy system is also the dirtiest energy system, as well as the oldest. And we can't just extend its life. We've got to replace it. And it has to be replaced with an energy system that deals with environmental degradation of physical waste, liquid waste, and gaseous waste. All three, simultaneously. And technology is a godsend when it comes to managing our waste. And when I think of the environment, I come at it as an industrialist, because that's who I am. I'm not a scientist who is exploring the impact on the globe. There are those who do. I respect what they do. I'm an industrialist. You make something dirty, you clean it up. Make the regulations, make the laws such that no company can exist over time that makes the world dirtier. The price of doing business in a dirty occupation like excavation, which is mining, which is oil drilling, which is uh, all kinds of mineral production, the price to do business is the price of cleanup. That's how you address the physical liquid and gaseous waste that the earth has been absorbing for far too long. The people who make the mess clean it up or they don't get to operate. And whether that's hydraulic fracking, whether that's coal mining, whether that's uranium mining, whatever it might be, including farming, including any kind of industrial production, no person has the right to leave a mess for somebody else. If that were our mantra, I believe we would have a cleaner biosphere that isn't just staying even, but getting better, getting healthier. And those who want to talk about global warming and climate change, that's fine. I want to get to the waste cleanup stage because that's what's causing the problem. But I talked last Friday to a group of environmentalists in California. Part of it was the Keystone XL pipeline discussion. And, and I, I said, you know, the public the general public that I talk to all over the country, while they express concerns about the environment, is not at the top of their list. It may be for you as environmentalists, but when you get very an animated, and when you talk about raising the price of oil that people have to buy so they'll use less, people don't have the money to pay more for oil to use less. 
They're not with you. What we have to talk about is what works at everyday working level solutions, which is managing our waste. And some cities in this country do a remarkable job of managing physical waste. And I give all credit to Waste Management as a company. That's a company's name. They do a fantastic job of managing waste. That's their business. And whether it's liquid or whether it's gaseous, technology is a way to clean it up. And we know how to do that. But we don't do it because it's not regulated to do it. And we don't have a lot of volunteers willing to add cost to their bottom line unless everybody has to add the cost to their bottom line. And so my advocacy of environmental improvement in this country is through a waste management regime or regimen that makes everybody responsible for their own waste as a part of doing the business that they do. So the solution here, ladies and gentlemen, can be self-made. It's what we do in America. We do work. We do business. Government doesn't make money. Government can print money, but it becomes worth less over time when all they do is print. We have money, we have prosperity when we have high employment, when we have <coughs> high wages, when we have more jobs than we have people. There's no reason we can't do that. We did it in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. We had a turn down in the early 80s. We had a turn down in the early 90s. But we've been on a turn down here in this country, ladies and gentlemen, now, realistically, going on six, seven, soon to be eight years. That's not who we are. And so what do we do? What do you do tomorrow morning? when you wake up and you realize we could be headed for prosperity. First and foremost, you become informed. Informed citizens are the best citizens in a democracy. Uninformed citizens or uncurious citizens, while they have an equal vote, actually don't know what they're voting on. So the first thing we do is get informed. The second thing we do is based on that information, we come to our own conclusions about what's right for you, for your family, for your community, for New Hampshire. What's right for you now and in the future? What's right? And based on that information and based on that choice, you activate the citizenship you're entitled to. And activate the citizenship means you are involved in the dialogue and the discussion. You are involved in the messaging that comes from you, the voter, to the person who works for you to win your vote. And remember that relationship. That person works for you, not the other way around. Too often, we look up to our elected officials as though they're the superior. That's not the way this system works, unless we let it. The design of the system is the other way around. And this state has the best reputation out of 50 to remind elected officials that that's the case. Sitting in a big state like Texas, which I do, I think those lucky, lucky people in New Hampshire, they get to decide who's going to get through the first primary test in the presidential campaigns. You're envied by the rest of the nation. You and Iowa. Two states that make or break very often candidates who we, will rep, who we will elect to represent us, to work for us. Remember, work for us, not the other way around. We may pay taxes. It beats the alternative. Because the alternative to not paying taxes is you're not here anymore. We may pay taxes, but that does not make us subordinate. It's additive to the superior role that we have 
in the choices that we make. So activating citizenship is the second thing we can do. The third thing, if you're really interested in this subject, my wife and I founded Citizens for Affordable Energy for one reason and one reason only, to engage the public in the 21st century energy and environmental solutions that this nation needs. It's free membership. You will never be asked for a dime. Our website, www.citizensforaffordableenergy.org. You can sign up. You can become a part of it. You can learn from it. You'll never be asked for a dime. We get no funding from energy companies. We won't take a dime from energy producers. Their mission in life is not affordable energy. Their mission in life is profitable energy because that's what enables them to produce ever more energy. And that's fine. I used to be there. This is about affordable energy because affordable energy is about developing and maintaining our lifestyles predicated upon the use of energy, all forms of energy. And you can become part of a larger group where perhaps your voice will grow and your voice will embellish with the voices of many others from, 50 other, from 49 other states. And at that point at which we can take a constituency to elected officials representing thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of people looking for a solution to the 21st century energy opportunities and environmental challenges that we face, our voice is that much stronger for no cost. Information, activism, membership. That's what you can do. I'm excited by it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm excited by the prospect of prosperity. I'm angered by the perversity of partisanship that we are tolerating today. I don't say shame on them, I say shame on us. That we would tolerate the perversity of partisanship. That we would tolerate the political time decisions, meaning decisions made in the heat of the next election battle, which mean nothing to the future of energy when you need energy decisions made in energy time, meaning decades of time, which they avoid making. The all in all the above energy plan is rhetoric. It is not substantive because there is no plan. It's the loose use of a word. There's intent, but there's no plan because plans have timetables and actions and accountabilities. There's no such plan. And it's, not the, it's just not the current president who's the problem. He's had examples to follow from the last seven predecessors. But that's not good enough for us. So a prospect of prosperity, overcome the perversity of partisanship, substitute energy time for political time. And ultimately, here's the bigger problem, and I'll end on this note. When I think of the 111th Congress, not a single energy bill, not one page, 112th, I think of eight presidents. I got to tell you, the system's not working. These are not all bad people. They're good public servants. They mean well. But they're not getting it done. If they were working in a company and you were the boss of the company, you'd fire them all because they're not getting it done for the American people. Not this term, not the last term, not the previous terms, not for the last 40 years when it comes to energy. We've been crushed by OPEC over these 40 years. The governance is broken, and the governance needs fixing. If eight presidents can't get it done, ladies and gentlemen, the ninth one's not going to do it. If 20 Congresses aren't going to get it done, the 21st isn't going to get it done either. The governance is broken. When I sat in my old office, I thought about all the governance that I faced as the head of an oil company. A president, 13 cabinet agencies in the executive branch, 26 congressional committees and subcommittees at the federal level, 800 federal judges. Any one of them could rule for or against an energy law or regulation. And that's just the beginning. Then 50 governors, 50 state legislatures, 50 state court systems. And that's also just the beginning. Because then you get to the thousands and thousands and thousands of municipalities and counties and townships, all of which have a voice, 
over how energy plays out in their geography. All of that governance, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not complaining about governance, because there got to be rules, and rules need to be followed. But all of that governance doesn't work together. It more often works apart, because each is taking care of his own. Now, if we had that kind of a monetary system, where each took care of his own 50 state monetary systems, a monetary system run out of the White House, a monetary system run out of the Congress, woe is us. That's what we had in the 19th century. Until in the 20th century, the monetary system collapsed not once but twice, 1907, 1912. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed, and an independent regulatory agency took over the monetary system of the country. So the management of the monetary system in this country for the last 100 years has been by an independent regulatory agency, not by the White House, not by the Congress, not by the courts. The Congress, of course, can pass the laws or change the laws that affect what the independent regulatory agency does. But if we've learned a lesson of governance in the monetary system, and it works because we're the world's largest economy, we're the world's only benchmark currency, and we can fix our monetary problems as and when they develop because we have this power that is assigned to this independent regulatory agency, why don't we do that for energy? Why don't we fix the governance of energy while we're at going after prosperity? If we fix the governance of energy where an independent regulatory agency has the final say over the next 10, 25, 50 years on the forms of energy we will use to power the nation, over the efficiency designs and techniques we will use to be more efficient in the production and use of energy, if we will have a way of agreeing to infrastructure that is governed at a super level so we can, instead of spreading pipelines and transmission lines, wherever in God's creation we decide to put them, we could channel them, we could gather them, just like we did an interstate highway system to take cars in certain locations but not others, we can do the same for infrastructure if we have a super independent regulatory agency setting the framework for that and we can fix the environmental challenges that we face because the supply of energy is correlated to the environmental protections we need with the infrastructure we'll use, with the increased efficiency we'll pursue, all while we are going about turning this country into a prosperous nation. Governance matters. Who makes the rules matters. And by having, and I've talked to the banks about this, what would you do if you didn't have the Fed? You talk to a banker about not having the Fed, they immediately are in fear. Who sets the rules? We can make money because we follow the rules. We can do the same with energy. Energy companies can make money because they follow the rules. Right now, there's no rules, big rules, that guide our energy future over 10, 25, 50 years. And that's what we need. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'm offering is a future of prosperity, a future of evolving energy supplies, a future of decarbonization of the energy space, a future of sound governance decision making that rationalizes the energy future over a 50 year time frame, not a two year election cycle, and is designed for you. More importantly, it's designed for your children. And even more importantly than that, it's designed for your grandchildren. And aren't they worth it? Yes, indeed. Thanks for listening. So I'll be happy to take questions or comments from the audience. Yes, sir. Do you want to take, go to the mic if you're good? Thank you for coming. Is it on? Okay. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Brian. I'm from right here in New Hampshire. 
Um, now, I don't know down in Texas if you've been keeping up, but um, up here we have uh, controversy about uh, what we call the Northern Pass. Uh, it's a coming like a power line coming down from Canada, uh, and it's supposed to provide power to New Hampshire and other Northeast areas. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know about you. I, I mean, I don't see that as a 21st century solution for you know environmental reasons political reasons, economic reasons. Um, you know, do you have an opinion on that? And you know, is, like, is this part of the solution, or is this just more of the same? I think in the short term, it's more of the same, where New England has a serious problem. When I was president of Shell, I was trying to build a liquefied natural gas regasification facility, uh, not in any one of the states, but in the Long Island Sound, where it would be protected from storms by Long Island, but it would be uh, not on land, where people had to worry about it, uh, and I was opposed by Connecticut, by New York, and by Long Island. But the fact of the matter is, LIPA on Long Island has the highest electricity rates in the country because it doesn't have enough natural gas. Here's a billion cubic feet a day on offer, but it was resisted because it was business as usual. Well, in one sense it's not because it's more power to a population that needs more power. Here's the problem as I see it with infrastructure. We have done a pretty lousy job of laying out the future of infrastructure to where people who have invested their life's savings in where they live with no idea that there would ever be an overhanging transmission line within sight of their property are now facing the prospect of this transmission line sitting right on top of their property, and they don't like it. And I understand that. Energy needs a multi-decade view. And if you are to, and we got to have infrastructure. We don't have infrastructure, we don't have lights. It's that simple. If we don't have enough infrastructure, we don't have lights. So the trade-off to me in infrastructure planning is looking at the long term and developing a long term plan that affects the least number of people. And those people need some compensation for what has affected the property value or the lifestyle that they'd been accustomed to. So if they choose, they could move to find it elsewhere. But without a plan and with, without you know, a, a governance that can deal with a plan over an extended period of time, we end up with these hot spots all over the country. Keystone Pipeline is exactly like your power line problem in northern New Hampshire. People don't want it in certain parts of the country. But because there's been no plan as to how to do this, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of miles of transmission lines. We have hundreds of thousands of miles of pipeline, and they've all been assigned willy-nilly to wherever people want to build them. And if things get really rough, the power of eminent domain comes into play, and people's voice is gone because eminent domain takes away their right, their property right. And, and that's a tough way for a democracy to live. So I'm all for more infrastructure to make sure we have affordable energy, but I'm also all for a long-term plan as to where and how that infrastructure is going to be placed on our territory. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thanks so much for coming this evening again. Um, my question is about oil subsidies. Um, what kind of role do you think that those are going to p play in um, alternate energy? Um, how will they evolve? How will they change um, as we look forward to um, more natural gas or other types of energy to use in the future. Thank you. I think the whole question of energy subsidies is suspect. Uh, I think that there are times and places for incentives to try to, from a public policy, make things happen. So a discount on battery cars, fine. Get some market going, fine. But put, an end, put a stop to it at some point. With respect to oil companies, and the tax code, some people call it subsidies, the tax code that affects oil companies. There are multiple kinds of oil companies that are impacted in different ways by the existing tax code. During one of my testimonies in Congress, I'm on public record, as are other big oil company CEOs, as saying the tax uh, policies in the existing code are not material to the economic decisions that we make in capital allocation for new projects. 
but when you propose a public policy that only affects five companies, and you want to take it away from five companies, the big ones, and no one else, that sounds discriminatory. So we'd be in favor of sitting down to have a longer discussion about revising the entirety of the tax code that affects the industry, but please don't discriminate against a couple of companies because that's just not fair. But with respect to those tax uh, code, current tax code, there are many small independent companies whose business model is predicated on that tax code because they don't have the capital wherewithal to withstand dry wells in the way a larger company might handle dry wells. And so the accelerated depreciation is really intended to help their bottom line of their business given their capital position. But all five CEOs said these particular tax codes are not material. And, and, but, but don't just attack five companies. That's not fair. That's like choosing to attack GM but not Ford and Chrysler or, or startups like Tesla or Fisker. And, and so you know, I'm all in favor of tax code revision done in a, 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 th in a thorough way that makes sense for everybody. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hoffmeister. Wonderful talk tonight. Uh, you said that uh, renewables, carbon-free renewables, are being developed too slowly right now. And I'm wondering what, if anything, federal government is doing to, to uh, foster the, this development, if it can adopt different policies that might uh, enable quicker development of these renewables. The $20 billion of TARP money that went to the Department of Energy has been largely squandered. It has gone to help produce, at today's technology capability, products that really are not very efficient in the marketplace or effective in the marketplace. If that $20 billion had been allocated to the university system of this country and to the renewable energy labs of this system to gear up a serious R&D effort, not unlike the R&D that took us to the moon in the 1960s, it would have been a far better choice in the use of those dollars. I'm all for doubling, doubling again taxpayer money to produce the benefits of research and development, particularly with respect to solar, because I think that's the end game for energy in this world, largely writ. The big supply of the 22nd century, I have no doubt, will be solar but without increasing the efficiency of the materials that absorb the sunlight, and today's products just don't make it, in my mind. They're better than they were 20 years ago, but it's still not going to compete with natural gas or with nuclear in terms of energy efficiency. And, and so a market is going to pay for that which is most efficient. So let's go on the research journey that makes solar far more efficient than it is today, and because of the natural intermittency of darkness and no sunlight, there has to be a solution from a storage standpoint that makes solar viable over, over the long term. So I, I think taxpayers, to me, have, a re, have an opportunity for R&D. Taxpayers should not subsidize somebody's idea of a manufacturing plant to make today's products with today's technology to so-called create jobs. The jobs created in some cases are gone away a long time ago, and the embarrassment of the uh, officials who approved loans to create those jobs is huge. That's not a good use of taxpayer money. We can do a lot better. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hoffmeister, and thank you again for coming this evening. <clears throat> My question is, we've seen a lot of developments recently with the military having a large role in promoting alternative energy development. For example, the United States Navy has developed a 50-50 blend of ethanol and algae, which they've been successfully able to run um, aircraft off of you know, naval carriers for, for operations. And the Marine Corps in Afghanistan has been able to cut um, fuel consumption on their outposts in Afghanistan by using solar panels. So my question is, how do you see the military and the Department of Defense kind of driving innovation in the energy sector? I think the same principle applies. We're paying $35 a gallon to have biodiesel and biomarine and bioaviation fuel. Uh, in, in a real world sense, we can't afford $35 a gallon. Not when the going market price is $4 a gallon. Who's paying for this? 
I, I think with respect to the solar panels, that's great. I really think there is an application for remote solar. In my former company, we did remote solar panel sales with micro loans in developing countries across parts of Africa Sierra, uh, uh, and, and, and other parts of Southeast Asia, which I think brings electricity where there is none and no prospect of any. So that is a, to me, we can be selective about this. Uh, I, I was embarrassed as a citizen to see President Obama in May 2009 go to a California Air Force base to congratulate the base on the commissioning of a 100 megawatt solar farm that he was there for the commissioning. When it turns out that that 100 megawatt solar farm would save the base roughly a million dollars a year and provide 24 percent of the base's electricity supply to save that million dollars a year and the cost of, of installation a hundred million dollars. That's not a business decision. That's a political decision. To have a hundred year payback on a project that isn't going to last 20 years, it'll never pay for itself ever or ever in the future. <laughs> So taxpayers who don't know, who aren't informed, don't know how they're being abused. And I consider that abuse of the taxpayer. Uh, it, it's, it's like, remember the, who, who was it? I think Senator Fulbright, those of you who go back in time a little bit. Senator Fulbright used to talk about the uh, $1,000 toilet seats on jet aircraft because of the special designs necessary and the limited quantities of toilet seats needed. I don't know if it was $1,000, but it was some exorbitant amount of money for toilet seats. You know, government has a way of being completely nonsensical in the name of whatever they do. That's why we, the citizens, have to tell these people they work for us, not the other way around, because they'll bankrupt us. And, and so I have no problem with R&D, as I said but applying already inefficient technology at exorbitant prices to say it can be done so you can hold your head up among a meeting of environmental supporters and donors to your contribution, to your campaign, that's politics. That's not necessarily solving the problem. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Uh, hello. Um, I think many of us like a lot of the ideas you're proposing, but one of the flies in the ointment, I suspect, would be the role of carbon dioxide, uh, increase in supplies of any fossil fuels, continued generation of carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases. You've embraced the principle that whoever makes a mess should clean it up. Is carbon dioxide part of the mess? And if so, who's responsible for cleaning it up? I, I believe that carbon dioxide is an emission. And because it's an emission, it needs to be part of the waste management process. Uh, if you go back in my history, you'll see that I was one of the first signers on of the United States Climate Action Partnership proposal for a cap and trade program to put a price on carbon because the price on carbon would drive cleaner solutions in order to earn the credits that a cap and trade system would pay to those who reduce their emissions uh, so that they can actually earn credits which they can then sell in the marketplace to those who are having difficulty reducing carbon emissions. That cap and trade program was presented to the 110th Congress, I'm sorry, 111th Congress, and it became known as the Waxman, Waxman Markey Bill. There was no recognition of what was passed as Waxman Markey relative to the framework that was presented to them months earlier. So most of the people who created that framework did not support the Waxman-Markey bill because it had so moved away from uh, a really serious effort at cap and trade to really reward the coal industry for voting for Waxman-Markey, where all the costs of Waxman-Markey went to industries other than coal because coal got a 25-year break on buying credits. So it was a joke of a bill. And the Senate wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And anyway, it only passed by eight votes, which means four people could have changed their vote, and it never would have become passed by the House. And now Waxman-Markey has created this whole pejorative 
negative nuance called tax and ca cap and tax. Cap and tax is nonsense in the true sense of a cap and trade program, like we did to clean up sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, which has gone a long way to making New Hampshire waters a lot cleaner than they used to be because of the, the acid rain that used to pour down on the state and others in New England from the Midwest. And so I believe that dealing with carbon dioxide is every bit as important as dealing with any other emission. A price on carbon will help that. I don't think a carbon tax is a solution because unless, unless carbon tax was used to, to promote cleaner energy. But too many people are talking about carbon tax as a way of rebating money to low-income citizens or reducing the national debt. And I think that'll just get money squandered and it won't take carbon out of the atmosphere. It'll just put taxes on people's backs. So I'm still a believer in cap and trade, but it's dead for a while. Uh, but I do think carbon needs a, needs a price. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, that was my position while I was at Shell. It has remained my position because I think the world would be better off with a cleanup program, and I call it waste management. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Tom Lurie. I'm a Manchester resident. I'm somewhat involved in the energy business, uh, uh, E&P business down south. But um, I'd just like to thank you and commend you for, um, for the efforts you're making. I, when my wife and I first heard you speak three years ago, I believe, I, I, I remember leaving the session saying, wow, here's a guy who was chairman of Shell Oil out living in airplanes, going around talking to small groups at universities, trying to give them real facts about the energy business, and um, which are rare and hard to find. And uh, so I'd just like to commend you for, for your efforts um, uh, in what could otherwise be a relaxing retirement, I'm sure. <laughs> um, back then, three years ago, and by the way, uh, if those students in the room are adults who have not read your book, uh, it is a uh, factual wonder. I mean, there's just, I don't know if the statistics have need, are in need of update at all, but, uh, but it is a terrific uh, source of information on the energy business. Three years ago, your hot point was less economic stimulation and more the need for creation of a uh, federal uh, energy board similar to the uh, Federal Reserve that would not be subject to the two-year political cycle. Um, we all know this uh, ridiculous political situation in Washington today, but have you, after three years on the road, seen any hope, uh, any ray of light with respect to your idea for uh, a Federal Energy Commission? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments. I really do appreciate it, and it helps motivate more of this, more, uh, more uh, engagement of more people. Uh, I think in concrete terms, in other words, is there a bill being drafted for Congress's consideration on changing the governance of energy, we're not there yet. But are there now hundreds of thousands of people across the nation who have said in one way or another, why haven't we thought of that before? Why have we been tolerating this punitive OPEC price cartel for all these years sitting on our own resources and punishing our own economy? So the effort has really been at the grassroots level. We're not there yet. I, I think we need 15 million people to say, yes, this matters, because that's 5% of the population. And any mass movement, whether it's Tea Party, whether it's uh, people that love battery-driven cars, you need 5%. The, the, the behavioral scientists, the political behavioral scientists will tell you 5% equals a mass movement. That doesn't mean it's a majority. It just means it's a mass movement. So we're working on the 15 million. And I will tell you that there are individual members of Congress who have been part of this education process who say, I get it. I get it. The caucus doesn't get it yet. So the Democratic caucus or the Republican caucus is a whole other entity apart from individual members of Congress. And the members of Congress dislike the caucus about as much as they dislike the other party because it constrains what they're able to do. But individual members are getting it. We're going to keep educating them. We now have ambassadors of Citizens for Affordable Energy in many states across the country who are going out on their own to try to carry this, this message forward. 
Uh, we don't have the resources to do a Boone Pickens, Pickens plan campaign. Boone Pickens, who's a, I consider a friend, told me I, he spent $78 million on the Pickens plan on television, his own money, not his investors' money, if you happen to be an investor in Boone Pickens, uh, BP uh, investors. But $78 million of his own dollars, we don't have that kind of money. And he said it was, I may as well have taken it out in the backyard and just burned it in a pile for all the good it did in reality with Congress. Because Congress is fundamentally passive reactive. They will only work on what people demand. There's no proactivity. We've seen that over and over. And it's not just the last four years. It's been going on for a long time. So we have to get the mass movement going. And that's what we'll keep working on. And individually, talking to members of Congress, I, I did a three-page paper for the president at the request of one of his cabinet secretaries. I haven't heard from him. Maybe he's been busy. <laughs> but that was about a year ago to describe what he could do in his second term uh, uh, as a legacy item in terms of governance of energy. Uh, it, who knows? It may have gone into the round file in his office, but uh, don't really know. But we're going to keep working on it and invite all of you and, and people that you know to join the effort, because the more the better. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, I would like to thank you for your presentation. Um, I believe you may have been included years ago <clears throat> in Anthony Sampson's book about the Seven Sisters. Uh, which was a response to the shortages he felt were created uh, by the federal government's, you know, policies early on, you know, as Carter was, you know, coming into office. But uh, it was simply a logistics problem. The petroleum products were there floating all over the world in the tankers but the government wouldn't allow them uh, to go beyond their allocations so much for New Jersey, so much for New York. And it was a government-created problem. And Anthony Sampson saw that and wrote the book about the large petroleum companies, the Seven Sisters. And I believe Shell was you know, one of those. Yes. Perhaps you could shed a little light on how competitive over the years the petroleum industry actually was. As a youngster, I can remember uh, there used to be you know, price wars between petroleum companies. Uh, as government got more involved over the years, they have complicated what used to be the American energy plan. The American energy plan is um, a part of our New Hampshire Constitution. It's Article 83, Part 2. And what it says is that it is the inherent and the essential right of every New Hampshire citizen to enjoy the benefits of free and fair competition in the trades and industries. And as government has gotten bigger, they've wrote the regulations that have interfered with that marketplace. There's no question but that the marketplace for energy is not a free market. And free market advocates who argue for a free market have to realize that the only free market left in transportation fuel today is the consumer's choice to turn right or turn left into the gas station of their choice. Everything else is completely governed by permit and by license and regulation, including the specifications for the product, including the specifications for the pumps, including the, uh, the ability to hold how much storage of product in your gas station, and, and it goes all the way to where you can drill a well and what is required for how that well gets drilled. And, and I'm not complaining about any of that. But what I am complaining about is access, the inability to access domestic resources that the government prohibits 
to the, dis, to the disinterest of its citizens, to the disadvantage, I'm sorry, of its citizens. Because it, it chooses not to grant access, we end up being more at the mercy of a cartel. But more specific to your point, if you go back to the gas wars of the 50s and the 60s, a lot of it was oversupply of product. Oversupply of product, which you can't hold in inventory but so long because diesel and gasoline deteriorate with age. And so you want to get that product moved, and so you discount the price, get it out of your tank so you can get a new load that's fresh because you don't want to sell old product to your customers. And the tea towels and the glassware and the silverware and, and the other things that you could get when you bought gas. Yes, for those of you who don't know that, we used to get our glasses, our, our drinking glasses, used to get our silverware, our tea towels, our bath towels, washcloths at the gas station, free, <laughs> to, to choose one product over the other. That competition for market share actually still exists. But it is more in the specifications of the fuel. So the additives that go into the fuel, if you study Tecron by Chevron, V-Power by Shell, uh, I forget what Exxon calls its high test, as well as if you see Shell stations today, there are nitrogen uh, advertisements on the pumps because it's the additives to the gasoline that they're trying to sell, competitively advantaged versus the other. But the competition goes further than that. The competition is who gets the right to drill where? That's the real competition for the upstream. And it is fierce. People that think of, and, and there's a, a person in this area called Bill McKibben. Some of you may have heard of Bill McKibben. He runs 350.org. I've been on panels with Bill, and I've had to correct him every time he says it, that oil companies, big oil companies, are an oligopoly that cooperate, don't compete. And I said, Bill, when is the last time you worked for a big oil company? What gives you the ability to say in a declarative sentence, they cooperate, they don't compete? Because you're dead wrong. And I think you're misusing the audience to make your own point because you're telling them something that's just not true. And you should apologize for giving a misstatement. I don't call it a lie. A misstatement to the audience. He doesn't like that. And then he corrects things I say it. I don't like either. But, but we, we respect each other. But the competition is intense. Yeah, well, that was the conclusion of Anthony Sampson, that the, the industry overall, overall should be you know, recognized for how fierce their competition was. Yeah, I mean, frankly, when, when I announced my retirement as a member of the American Petroleum Institute Executive Committee, which I had because I was in the job I was in, I think the happiest person that day that I announced my retirement was the chairman of the American Petroleum Institute, the CEO of another oil company, because he wouldn't have to deal with me anymore. <laughs> and we didn't agree on many things. Mm -hmm. He was so glad I would go away. It would make his job easier. And, and so, but, but I had a job to do, he had a job to do. And we didn't see eye to eye on many things, most notably cap and trade. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, sir. Thank Any you. last question? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, in the back? Two more. Two more? Yep. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, I have a question regarding the Keystone XL pipeline and the refining of the tar sands. Uh, do you feel that is a viable process for us, given the fact that the uh, fossil, uh, that the carbon output through the process of refining and pumping the fuels through the United States uh, would be a viable way to get, to get petroleum for the United States? It's a controversial topic because of the political season in which the decision needed to be made. But it was punted rather than decision made. Uh, Bill McKibben and Michael Brune from the Sierra Club and Daryl Hanna from Hollywood are developing a notorious reputation deliberately on opposing the Keystone XL pipeline. Here's a reality that Daryl Hanna and Bill McKibben, McKibben and Michael Brune can't do anything about. The sovereign nation of Canada decided in 1992 or 93 that the oil sands of Alberta, Canada would be developed as a national strategic natural resource national strategic natural resource, and that in the interest of the Canadian citizens, it would be developed fully and commercially 
to the benefit of the exporting uh, economy of Canada, as well as domestic consumption. Since that strategic decision was made, approved by Parliament, it's been a 20-year journey now to develop the Canadian oil sands. They are looking for markets for that product because they now can produce about 3 million barrels a day. Their goal is to produce about 6 million barrels a day in the, next, in the 2020s. The oil is going to be produced. We're the biggest market in the world for petroleum products, and we're right next door to Canada. We're going to use petroleum products for the next decades. So the question for this country is, do we import Canadian oil and make use of our neighbor's production with the consequences that come from it? Or will some other country benefit from the production of Canadian oil, uh, perhaps worried less about the consequences of the production of it? Here's a couple things that are happening that is not well told, a story not well told by the Canadians. The open pit mining that has been historically the way of producing oil sands oil to where you need to mine it, upgrade it, and then refine it, and then pipe it out, has changed dramatically in the last five years with a technology called SAG-D. SAG-D is a technology that drills a hole in the ground, not an open pit mine, drills a hole in the ground and puts steam into the earth to use heat to make the molecules of oil move off the sand that's there and then collect it in a pool and pump it out. It's already upgraded when it comes out of the ground, so you take it right to the refinery. A dramatic decrease in the carbon footprint of producing oil sands oil because you don't do the mining, you don't do the upgrading. That story needs to be told. The lakes, the polluted lakes of oil, uh, of upgrading residue, they're going away. Part of oil sands development was a reclamation requirement that while you may have these settling ponds, which are environmental disasters, they're filthy, dirty ponds of oil excrement, basically, they have to go away. And they are going away because SAG-D and the change in the upgrading process enables them to go away. So the water is clean, the ponds are filled in with earth, and topsoil is laid on top so that the boreal forest can regrow again. So there's a whole system story that needs to be told, but as long as America is going to import oil, I, I personally recommend importing it from Canada versus Venezuela versus Middle East versus other parts of the world that just plain don't like us while we produce our own domestically. Because you notice I didn't close the gap from 15 million barrels that I talked about to the 18 we need. So we still need some imports. And I suggest Canada and Mexico could be the source of those imports. The pipeline itself, uh, we have 200,000 miles of oil carrying pipelines in this country. And if they all leaked, we wouldn't have any. But they don't leak if they're maintained properly. So I think there's a way to manage it. Uh, and, and I think we, to refine the oil on the Gulf Coast recognizes that eventually we're not going to use oil because otherwise we'd build refineries in Canada or North Dakota and ship final product. But by sending the crude oil to the Gulf Coast where existing refineries operate, it's actually more economical than building new refineries, which probably won't have more than a 40, 50 year life while those refineries on the Gulf Coast already, some of them have a 100-year life. And they kept getting modernized with time. So I think it's a good system overall. And if the US doesn't want the oil, Mr. Olive, the oil minister, has told me to my face, if the US doesn't want the oil, others do. We're going to produce the oil. OK, thank you. Roger Martin. Um, this morning on the exchange, you talked about the closed system for fracking. Could you briefly explain exactly how a closed system would work so that the water supplies wouldn't get contaminated? The only way to frack safely, in my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, is to appropriately design the well and to apply the cement and to use the materials that create a closed system for the entry and exit of the water, sand, and a little bit of chemical formula that is used for the fracking process. The way you have a closed system is the well is tight. And what goes into the well is measured. What goes down the well and is used to force 
uh, after the explosion to force the uh, exploded area open so molecules can flow, held open by what are called propants or sand that keep the little molecular pieces of, uh, of rock under the ground or shale under the ground from closing in again so the molecules of oil or gas or natural gas liquid can flow through the well is to make sure that whatever goes in either stays in or comes out. And you measure what comes out. But when it comes out of the well, it's again in a closed system. So it is piped directly into either a water management system on site or it is piped directly into a truck which safely and securely takes that filthy water to a disposal site that either puts it under the ground where it will never bother anyone again or puts it in a cleanup site, a, a, a water treatment site that is central to multiple wells. You can measure the amount in and the amount out. And you can hold companies accountable to explain how they match the ins and the outs or while recognizing that some amount of water may st well stay down in the well. If it stays down in the well, it's not a problem. It's, it's thousands of feet below the surface, layers of clay, layers of rock. There's no way for that water to migrate to the water table that people use. The water table that people use is generally within 300 feet of the surface of the earth. And with thousands of feet of separation and with a tightly cemented well, you're not going to get migration. Uh, it, it just, and then when you ultimately decommission the well, you reinforce the cement that is cased around the, that is blocking the outside of the well casing, and you fill the pipe that you leave in the ground with cement so that there's no way that water or methane could migrate out of the well, and then you measure. You have monitors on the decommissioned well to make sure that you are not leaking anything from the well, and that's measured over time until finally you're, per, you're permitted to stop measuring it because you've satisfied government authorities that this is not a well that's gonna leak. So that's what I mean by a closed system. You can manage it with technology, with engineering, and with materials, and you can treat the water to where it is safe then to dispose it either underground, where it's gone for good, or it can be like other wastewater treated and then disposed of in, 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 in on-surface uh, water systems like, like rivers. I mean, what comes out of a sewage plant goes into a river somewhere, and it's considered safe. And the same can be done with the, with the fracking water. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being a great audience.